What's up, everyone? Welcome back to Draft Season Never Ends, the Aftermath NFL Draft Podcast. My name is Chris McGlynn, host of the show, and boy, do we have a lot to talk about today. And uh, that's mostly going to be about the beatdown we saw from Georgia on TCU on Monday night. I mean, simply one of the most lopsided football games I think I've ever witnessed. Might be the most lopsided football game I've ever witnessed. Uh, I know the, the stats and everything else that made the rounds today said it was the largest margin of victory in a bowl game ever and bowl games have been played for over 100 years so i mean really remarkable when you think about what georgia was able to do we're going to break it all down uh in in depth here and talk about some of the biggest prospects making some big plays in this one and uh yeah i think there's no other place to start here than jalen carter just this was the performance that we expected from him against ohio state now you could say oh well you know this was a worse team you know, clearly Ohio State was a better matchup for for Georgia. TCU's offensive line, while obviously not playing great on Monday night, uh, the, Max Duggan was under pressure quite a bit. But uh, the the TCU offensive line is a pretty experienced group. It's a lot of third, fourth, fifth, even sixth year players on that unit. There's not a bunch of freshmen or sophomores still trying to figure out their way here. Uh, it's a it's a pretty talented group up front. One of the better. I'd, I'd say probably the best offensive line of the Big 12, one of the better units in the country. And Georgia made them look silly pretty much all night long, especially Carter, who had his way with it, man. He was splitting double teams. He was working over the top of guards. He was blowing up running plays. I mean, he was getting pressure. He didn't have a ton of sacks. Like, you're not going to look at the stat line here and say, oh, my goodness, like, what a performance from Jalen Carter. But that's the importance here of not box score scouting this, right? That's That's what we talk about a lot. You know, a perfect example I think of was when Chase Young was playing in the college world playoff a couple years back, and everybody said, oh, wow, he really didn't have a great game. And it's like, well, you clearly didn't watch the game yet then because you, you look at his stats, and yeah, he, pretty pedestrian stats, nothing too special, but if you watched the game, you saw how much Chase Young affected things because he was able to get pressure in there consistently. He made the quarterback uncomfortable, and it made a world of difference, right? I mean, that's that's the type of the impact that we're talking about here with Jalen Carter. He made Max Duggan uncomfortable all night long, and credit to Georgia because they stayed in those pass rush lanes. Duggan did not really get out and scramble much like we're used to seeing from him until later in the contest well after it was out of reach because this game was over by middle of the second quarter. I mean, it was 35-7, to 31-7 at halftime. I mean, it was not even close. Uh, I mean, we can talk, I'll talk, I'm sure, a little bit more in depth at some point about Kirby Smart and what he's able, been able to do with this program because it's really remarkable uh, what he's been able to do, the ability to turn things over. This, this team had 15, 15 players selected in the NFL draft last year, including five first-rounders on defense. And they are back... They were better this year by record. I mean, they went 15-0. They were undefeated. They won the SEC championship, won the college football playoff, won a national championship. I mean, what Kirby Smart is doing there is truly remarkable. And and clearly, Georgia right now is on its way to becoming this kind of new age version of Alabama, right? And I don't think Alabama's done yet. They certainly have tons of pro prospects, and Nick Saban's going to be able to continue to churn out every single year. But... When you start scouting every year, it's going to be with Georgia or, you know, at that point, at this point, because that's just where the talent is coming from. And before too long, I have a feeling that we're going to start to see it at, you know, some of the other positions that Georgia hasn't churned out yet, namely quarterback. Uh, I know now go back far enough. Yes, you got to Matthew Stafford, but since then, haven't really had a ton of pro quarterbacks. That's a lot of how this team, uh, Alabama was for a really long time, right? They produced talent for the NFL level at every other position except quarterback. Now you look back over the last few years, they've had Mac Jones, they've had Jalen Hurts, they've had Tua Tagovailoa. So clearly there's a decent amount of talent there. And so I wonder if we're going to get to that point. Now, I do actually want to talk about Stetson Bennett because he's the quarterback of these Georgia Bulldogs. And while he won't be a first round pick, right? I I think we can pretty comfortably say that. Guy's 25 years old. He's just too old to really be looked at as a prospect that you bring in and develop, and he's not quite playing at a level where you look at him and go, oh my God, he's clearly ready to start in the NFL next year. And so that kind of puts him into this unique situation where he probably, you know, is a mid-round pick at this point, where he he's good enough to play in the NFL, but he's not enough of a developmental player to, you know, whatever, to be able to say, okay, we should invest in him and hope in his long-term potential. Mm-hmm. 25 years old. 
Some amateur lighting here. 25 years old, you don't really have a whole lot more developing to do. I mean, he can play for a while longer. That's very possible. But uh, by 25, you've done a lot of the development. I mean, he's older than four of the starting quarterbacks in the NFL playoffs this year. So that should give you an idea of a sense for what we're looking at with Stetson Bennett. But I do want to point this out. He's got the arm talent, right? He he does he he is able to has the mobility, has the size, clearly has the smarts. I think that may be the most it might be the most important part of all of this is that Stetson Bennett clearly has the intelligence to be able to play in the NFL level. He does a great job of looking off defenders, fitting balls into tight windows, leading receivers, anticipating where they go. His ball placement is really good. I could see him being what I, I kind of look at as like a high-end backup spot starter type of player. Honestly, it reminds me a little bit of like Teddy Bridgewater, maybe Case Keenum, right? Somebody who's in that role where you feel really good about having them as a backup. Even Gardner Minshew, I think, has really worked himself into that category at this point where if you need them to go out there and win a game for you at some point because your starter gets hurt or whatever it might be, uh, he can't do that. Or he could potentially be a bridge quarterback as you bring along a younger player. Uh, but I don't think we're ever going to look at Stetson Bennett and look at him as being a franchise quarterback in the league. I think he could be a really solid player, you know, somebody that gets on the field and, you know, might be, you know, there's there's so many of these guys that have made a living out of it by being great backup quarterbacks. Chase Daniel, Josh McCown, I mean, you name it, the list goes on and on. I'm just talking about recent guys too. <laughs> so I think Stetson Bennett, there is a role for him in the NFL, but I look at him as probably being more of like a fourth or fifth round pick where you're going to find a quality backup quarterback. You know that he's going to bring value to your team and he's a really smart guy. So he's going to actually really improve uh, the understanding and development of your quarterback room. And it's weird to say that about a guy that's coming out of college, but He's not even really like a rookie, right? I mean, he's been around forever at this point. So, uh, you know, it's it's hard to really envision Stetson Bennett being anything other than, uh, you know, a, a kind of a very smart, very intelligent, high awareness, high, uh, you know, kind of playbook savvy type of player that gets out there, you know, and, and fills in for you when your starting quarterback gets hurt. You know, a uh, great example of teams that I think could, could be looking for a quarterback like that, the Chicago Bears, right? Justin Fields has had some injury issues. Arizona Cardinals, same thing goes Kyler Murray. We don't know when he's going to be back. I know they've had Colt McCoy in there, but, uh, you know, even he got hurt this year, and Trace McSorley clearly wasn't the answer. Uh, Miami Dolphins could certainly be in that mix as well, too. Attack of Aloha, unfortunately, been dealing with a lot of injuries. And I know Teddy's there right now, but I don't know how much longer Teddy will be with Miami, so... Uh, you know, there's certainly a lot of teams that I think could use a quality backup quarterback. Hell, the New York Jets could certainly use one, but they could probably also use a starting quarterback. They have a bunch of backup quarterbacks. That's the problem. So long story short is I do think there's a lot of people saying, oh, Stetson Bennett is worth a seventh round flyer. Stetson Bennett will not be there in the seventh round. He's going to impress teams with his work on the board. He's super bright. He's very intelligent. He's a clear leader. And he was able to do that in the last two years at Georgia. And he's overcome literally everything. Any obstacle you want to throw at Stetson Bennett, he has overcome. His own offensive coordinator, right before the college football playoff semifinal, admitted to the fact that they got it wrong. They basically tried to put whatever obstacle and hurdle in the way of Stetson Bennett. They didn't want him to be the quarterback. And he said, be damned, I'm going to be the quarterback. And he was. And he did a fantastic job the last two years for this Georgia offense. I, I, you know, as great as the talent as he has around him, and obviously the amount of pressure that he... I mean, Stetson Bennett looked really good last night. He also could have been absolutely terrible, and Georgia would have won that game totally fine because that's just how dominant Georgia was. But uh, Bennett has been a big part of this team's success, and I do think he has a very clear NFL future. He will probably be a day three pick, but I think it'll be an early day three pick. You want to look at this as there being quarterback tiers, right? I think this is a good way to kind of examine it. There's clearly, uh, to me, there's a tier one that is C.J. Stroud and Bryce Young. Those guys are in a tier by themselves, the top two quarterbacks in this class. Then if you want to go to Tier 2, and that's where we get to Anthony Richardson and Will Levis. And then you go to Tier 3, and there's a big drop-off between 2 and 3. Let's make that very clear. This is not a very good quarterback class. A lot of the guys that we were hoping would kind of fill out this group and maybe offer some depth to the class overall have decided to go back to school, whether that be a Cam Ward, uh, you know, whether that be a Grayson McCall, uh, whether that be, you know, you go down the list, uh, Tyler Van Dyke, I mean, you go on and on and on, Devin Leary, there's plenty of guys we thought would be potentially coming out this year that opted to go back to school instead or transfer or whatever it might be 
but they're staying in college football and not going to be in the NFL. So that tier three, there's a big drop off. And that's where you get into the range of like a, a Hendon Hooker. Maybe you get to like a Jake Hayner at a Fresno, Fresno State. And this is where I think we get to Stetson Bennett. And now I think he's a little bit on the lower end of this. I think he's probably towards the back of tier three, kind of on that tier three, tier, tier four border. But I still probably have him right there in the mix with, like, a, let's say, like, like a Jaron Hall, right, out of BYU, who, similar situation where he's a much older prospect, and, you know, maybe there's a little bit more athleticism and excitement and explosive play to him, but he's nowhere near as consistent as what Stetson Bennett is, so it's kind of a pick your poison there. Uh, you know, Tanner McKee is probably a tier three guy that's right in there with him, might have a little more upside, but it's definitely nowhere near as polished at this point. So it's, it's kind of depending on what teams you're looking for here. If you're looking for a project quarterback, Sets of Bennett's not going to fit that mold, but I think that's kind of where we're looking at him there. He's probably like that, you know, at the back end of what I call tier three that includes McKee, Hooker, Hayner, but he's still, I think, like a half step up on like guys like a, a Clayton Toon who comes out of Houston or, you know, like I said, Hall. Uh, there's, there's a few others. Aiden O'Connell out of Purdue, I think, is right in that tier four group as a guy that, you know, maybe he's like a sixth, seventh round guy that you could take a flyer on and see if you can develop him. Might be a priority free agent. It's just not a great quarterback class this year, unfortunately. Uh, we kind of had some high hopes for it going in, and it hasn't quite panned out. But all this to say that I think Stetson Bennett clearly has an NFL future. Anybody who says otherwise at this point is kidding themselves. And now I think you just need to be very clear about what the NFL future is. It's not going to be a starting quarterback, a, a rock star quarterback. But hell, if we can see Brock Purdy do this in San Francisco, what's to say that Stetson Bennett in the right situation and with the right talent around him, can't possibly lead a team into the playoffs. I think it's very possible, but that's more about him being in the right system and the right situation than Stetson Bennett being the guy that's going to carry you there and take you there. It's not Patrick Mahomes. It's not Justin Herbert. It's not Trevor Lawrence, right? That's not what we're talking about here with Stetson Bennett. But it could be like a Brock Purdy. It could be like, you know, a couple of the other guys I named there, uh, whether it's Case Keenum or Gardner Minshew or whoever it might be. I think Stetson Bennett clearly has an NFL future, and anybody who says otherwise at this point either doesn't like Stetson Bennett or just doesn't understand where his role is in the NFL because he'll be there. I promise you that. Looking elsewhere here, there were definitely a couple other players I wanted to highlight, and I think one of the biggest matchups of the entire night that I really was kind of surprised that it went this way, especially given what we saw in the college football playoff semifinal, was Keely Ringo matching up against Quentin Johnson. And I think it's actually less to do with Johnston here and more that Ringo had a better game and TCU had no idea what the hell it was doing on offense in this game whatsoever. Uh, I mean, Max Duggan, under pressure all night long, you can't fault him for that, right? He's trying to make the best of it. The offensive line played terrible, especially the right side of that offensive line. Absolutely horrendous. But I mean, he had Quentin Johnson wide open over the middle of the field on what wound up being the first interception of the game for him. Throw that ball anywhere towards the inside of the field. That's an easy catch. Might even be a touchdown there if Johnson's able to shake the tackle of Jonathan Bullard. Instead, he throws it way over Johnson's head and right to the safety. So, And give Bullard credit. He still made a nice play on the ball. He read it right. But, I mean, my God, that was a horrendous read and horrendous decision, again, because he was under pressure and he didn't react well. So I don't look at this as a huge indictment on Johnston. I, I would have loved to have seen him obviously have a bit more production than we saw in this game. And I think Georgia did a good job scheming up for him and stuff like that. And there are some questions to go back and look at this film and really determine, okay, was this just a bad game for the whole TCU offense? Or are there question marks that we have to have now around Quentin Johnston? I think it's more the former than the latter there. I put this more on TCU as a whole than I do on anything that Quentin Johnson did specifically. But it also was a nice thing to see from Keely Ringo. It would have been a really unfortunate thing for him if the last thing we watched was him getting absolutely burnt all over the field by Ohio State. And I think T uh, Georgia did a much better job. Kirby Smart and company, that defensive staff, did a really good job of game planning appropriately, putting him in positions to succeed. And also, it just seemed like Georgia got a bit of a wake-up call. I know I meant to mention this before when we're talking about Jalen Carter, but watching the pregame coverage, uh, you know, talking about what the players were doing, Carter himself, Carter is one of, if not the most talented player in college football at this point, likely the number one prospect on the board for most people, and potentially the number one overall pick that the Chicago Bears are sitting there at number one. He could be the first player off the board, and he looked terrible against Ohio State. And what was he doing all week? He was up at 8 a.m. running on the treadmill, making sure that he was ready for this game. That was the type of wake-up call that they got 
from that Buckeye team. And you saw the difference here. He was clearly ready for this game. And so that's a bit of a concern that he was not prepared for that in the first place. But man, this was just an overall thing of like, okay, Georgia played their best game. They came out and they were ready for this. And I think that goes for Ringo as well. He clearly was not prepared for what Ohio State was going to throw at him with uh, Ibuka and Harrison Jr. And, and, you know, that the whole gamut there of receivers that Ohio State has to throw out there and consistently able to target and find success with. Now, I th still think there are questions that need to be asked, and I have some concerns with Ringo because I think Matt Miller, as I mentioned in my last podcast, uh, previewing the game was... You know, he was more, he's, he's, he's not a ballerina, he's, he's a bully, right? And that's, that's a perfect way to describe Ringo. But I also think that means that he's a little bit more limited scheme-wise for where you could fit him in. So there are still some very real concerns about what we saw in the Ohio State game, but he bounced back nicely in this contest and played much better overall. Jonathan Bullard obviously played fantastic, turned a lot of heads. So many, some great players in this Georgia team too, be watching in the future that are definitely going to be NFL prospects. A lot of guys that were freshmen, sophomores, players that are not yet draft eligible that made plays all night long on the defensive side of the ball for Georgia. One last name here that I want to shout out, and this is on the TCU side. It's hard to find a whole lot of positives from a 65 to 7 beatdown. Uh, but I think Steve Avila, who I, I mentioned during the, the preview show, uh, is the left guard for TCU. I actually think he played decently well, all things considered. Pretty much all night long, the pressure was coming, but the pressure was largely coming from the right side of the line, and Avila did a pretty solid job, both against Carter and Stackhouse and several of the other guys that Georgia threw at him all night long. Now, I don't think he was perfect, but I think he did enough that an NFL team is going to look at that and say, hey, this guy's got something here. Maybe he's somebody we bring in and use as a depth guy uh, along the offensive line, could be a fourth or fifth round pick, somebody who's going to come in and, and compete for a guard spot on the roster, and we'll see what happens. That's kind of where I think he fits here. I'm not saying he's going to be a second round pick by any means, somebody who's a potential starter, but maybe fifth round, I, I think he could be somebody that comes in and uh, just provides, obviously, he's got a ton of experience. Uh, he's a 60-year player, if I'm not mistaken, um, who's played in a lot of games at this point in his career. He's started a number of different positions. And so, yeah, I think he would be a really strong interior lineman who's got a chance to maybe be a spot started on the line, you know, possibly be a filling guy, somebody that you can have plug a number of different holes. Those, those, those players are really invaluable for teams. I mean, uh, the perfect example, I think, is like a guy like Zach Tom this year for the Green Bay Packers, who, who's played a bunch of different positions. And honestly, that's been a staple for the Packers. They had Elton Jenkins do it years before him. Now he's getting paid big money because of his ability to line up wherever and play at a pretty high level. Uh, and Zach Tom did a lot of that this year. He played mostly right tackle, but he's played both guard positions. He's played pretty much, I think he played left tackle too. He's played pretty much everywhere but center. So yeah, I, I mean, that's the type of thing we're talking about here. I don't think Avila maybe is quite that versatile, but a guy that's able to line up in multiple positions along the offensive line is always going to be something that scouts, coaches, whatever the whoever's making the decisions in those front offices and in those war rooms on draft day is going to value and is going to be able to say, hey, that guy can fill more than one need for us on this team. That's always a huge thing. And I think Avila does a really nice job with that. So I wanted to shout him out, trying to find some silver lining here for TCU because there's not a whole lot that you can circle. But I mean, credit to the Horned Frogs, man. I, I know this is obviously a really, really rough end to what was a fantastic season for them. But I think we got to focus on the fantastic season part of it. There is no way that anybody had TCU in the national championship game when the season began. We talked about it before. They were picked seventh in their conference in the preseason. Forget the country. They weren't even ranked. So for them to make it to the college football playoff, upset Michigan, and make it to the national championship game, I know they came out flat and they played a terrible, terrible game. And the worst game that TCU has played all year, no question. I think it was TCU's worst game. I also think it was Georgia's best game. And even if TCU played their best game, they weren't going to beat Georgia with how Georgia was playing in this one. That's just the simple fact of it. I, I think Georgia was just too talented, too good, too well coached. And uh, but this is a huge springboard here for, for TCU. It's going to be a little bit before we, I think we see them back among the powers of college football, maybe as a contender to be in the college football playoff now that it's going to expand in 2024. I think eventually we will see TCU there, but they have a lot of turnover coming right now. And I think they're going to be in a position where maybe they win seven, eight games in the upcoming year. I think they still have enough talent returning, especially if they get a couple guys back. To, you know, There's a couple guys that we're still waiting to figure out what their draft decision is going to be. But I think Sonny Dykes is really doing something great there. Credit to Gary Patterson as well, who was the coach there before him. Uh, he built a great program, and Dykes was able to take it over the next level. 
Um, you know, there's no way that Dykes is able to do that with the foundation that that Patterson put in place. Um, but yeah, I mean, man, there's there's so much I think positivity that you could find with, from this whole situation with TCU. And I think the future is pretty bright for that school. Uh, there's there's no way to spin this other than this was a great year for TCU. I know, obviously, coming up this short stings and is embarrassing in a lot of ways, especially on a national stage like that. But you know, I, I think there's no question that you'd rather be there, you get the exposure, and you do what you can for the program. And man, they paid for stadium renovations, they paid for facility renovations just this year alone because of how much exposure they managed to get. And they're going to be, it's going to be much, much easier for Sunny Dykes to sit down and be able to sell recruits and say, hey, we made it to the college football playoff once. We can do that again. That's the type of program we are here at TCU. So credit to the Horn Frogs, man. I know it was a disappointing finish to the season, but it's uh, still a really fun ride and, and an awesome story all year long. And there's going to be some players on that team that end up playing on Sundays, no question about it, whether it's Johnny Hodges or D. Winters or, uh, you know, like I said, Steve Avila. There's going to be a few guys that find their way into the NFL, playing on the next level. Trivia's Tom, uh, Tom Hodges Tomlinson, uh, who had a bit of a rough game. I know he didn't have the best game of his career, but another guy that I think was going to definitely end up in the NFL at some point or another. So uh, credit to the Horn Frogs, like I said. There's not really a whole lot more to say than that. But that's kind of my breakdown here. Uh, obviously, a very lopsided championship game. Was hoping for a better game, obviously. I was very wrong on this. I thought it was going to be uh, Georgia win, but TCU cover. So maybe somewhere in that 13, 10, 13 point win. You know, Georgia, you know, maybe kicks a late field goal to really make it feel like it's out of reach. Uh, you know, something like that. But, you know, leading comfortably. I think Georgia was the better team. But I didn't think TCU was going to get school like that. So, uh, I mean, credit to the Bulldogs, too. Uh, we'll just give credit all the way around. So, But, hey, it's, it's uh, kind of bittersweet, right? The college football season is over. Obviously, draft season is just getting underway. Important note here, uh, the deadline to declare for players is January 16th. So that's coming up very shortly. So there's a couple guys that are still out there that we're unsure of. A lot of players that declared today. Paris Johnson Jr. from Ohio State, I saw declared. Jalen Carter officially declared. I'm sure we'll get a bunch more player de- declarations in the next few days. So make sure you keep an eye out for that because there's a lot of players where it's unclear what they're going to end up doing. So the deadline is January 16th, which I want to say is next Monday. Does that sound right? I don't know. Days of the week are hard. I believe that's next Monday. So January 16th, keep an eye out for that. Make sure you're keeping an eye out, and uh, we'll see who ends up declaring. And then before you know it, we'll be into Senior Bowl week, East-West Shrine Bowl game. Tons and tons of draft prep, and, you know, combines not too long after that. So, anyway, enjoy the NFL playoffs. That's coming up soon. We had a lot of coaching changes in the NFL as well. Maybe talk about that a little bit more on Friday, right? We're going to have a Friday show this week. I know this is coming out Wednesday, recording this late Tuesday night. National Championship being on Monday night. I get it. It's dumb. It should be on Saturdays, but that's a whole nother argument. Anyway, because of that, Wednesday show, Friday show this week, hopefully going to be going back to that Tuesday, Thursday cadence starting next week again. But uh, as always, thanks everybody for tuning in. Really appreciate it. Uh, if that's your first time listening to the show, thanks for stopping by. I really appreciate it. Hope you come back. Hope you've enjoyed what you've listened to so far. You can find the show on any podcast platform you like, Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, Anchor, Tune in, I think. Uh, I mean, pretty much anywhere that you can get podcasts should be available. And if you can't find it there, feel free to let me know. I'll do my best. I can't guarantee anything, but I'll do my best to try and make it happen and see what I can uh, can I figure out. And if you want to interact with me, you can feel free to on social media. Uh, my Twitter handle is at cmcglynn84. You can also follow the show at, C, uh, no, at aftermathsports.com. Uh, at, uh, man, we're going to try that again. Aftermathsports.com and <laughs> at aftermathsports on both Facebook and Twitter. And as I just plugged, aftermathsports.com had a mini mock draft that just came out on Monday. Uh, top 18 picks now that the NFL regular season is done. Those 18 draft slots are all solidified. So I did a kind of a mini mock of everything there, including a big trade up, a team trading up to number one to go get a quarterback. So if you want to check that out, like I said, aftermathsports.com, uh, it's available there. Also shared it on all my social media platforms. So you'll be able to find it there as well. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Rate, review, subscribe. Remember that draft season never ends, and we'll talk again soon.